Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I am your host, Kevin, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Sam Jennings II. Do you like, you like the second? Do you like junior? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, the, the second is there to prevent the junior. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> it just sounds very formal, and I like it. Um, right, right. <laughs> Dr. Sam, for short, um, a stealth coach for decades. Dr. Sam is now a leadership strategist for mid-level professionals who are responsible for leading leaders. Sam, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm so glad I get to talk to you for a little while. Yes, totally my pleasure. And as we proceed, Sam is just fine. Dr. Sam is fun, but let's just go with Sam. <laughs> I, li I like a fine and I like a fun. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> So let's get started at the start, more or less. How did you how did you discover, find out, begin to become a coach? Obviously, you had a stealth beginning, as you indicated in your little bio. Right. Um, but how did that develop and mature and grow into your own coaching business? Mm -hmm. So the stealth aspect was my background in higher education. I'd been doing student affairs work, which is the non-academic side, for a couple of decades. And then life circumstances happened and we chose to leave, we being me and my family, chose to leave the Midwest, move to the Pacific Northwest to help out with parents and that kind of thing. And um, once I had that separation, I had time to think about what did I like about higher ed. And it was the individual service to the uh, students as well as colleagues, other staff, and helping other people see their circumstances for what they are and as how they perceive them and then how to move forward. And I realized, well, this is nonsense. I've been a coach my whole career. I just wouldn't have called it coaching. <laughs> and then once I realized that, was able to move towards some accreditation, some more learning and, and more engagement and um, started my own business. And it's been fabulous being able to help grownups unpack their stuff to a degree that's not therapy, of course, but it is helping them see what's going on. And as somebody much wiser than me said, you can't read the label if you're inside the box. So I helped them read the label and then decide what to do. I like that a lot. I think I think that might be the title of the episode. It's a little, little, little long, but I really, really love that. Right, right. It's that kind of it's that kind of simple wisdom. It's like, oh, of course, but that's that's exactly right. what it is. And I really love the fact that like, and you you have this in common with a lot of other coaches too, although they don't always articulate it quite so well as you just did. But you kind of realize that you just you were already coaching. You just didn't have that word for it. Right. And so once you have that word, it helps you to distinguish what coaching actually is and what it does different from say, and you made a great example there, therapy, because coaching is not therapy. Right. They, they do have some, they serve a similar purpose, but very distinctly and very differently from each other. And I feel like just having the word coach makes such a difference in what you're able to do and how you're able to help. Absolutely. In coaching and therapy, you know, sure, they may be in the same neighborhood, but they don't reside in each other's houses. It is absolutely separate and necessarily so. It's another, that's another good one. They might be part of the same HOA, but they're, they're, living, in, they're living on separate properties. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, let's jump forward to the present. I'm sure there's plenty of stories you have over the decades, but what does your coaching sure. business look like today? Um, who do you coach? How do you coach them? Are you typically more one-to-one? -one. Do you do like small group or mastermind coaching, keynote speeches, any, you know, all of the above? How do you, how do you go right. about coaching and who do you coach? For sure. So my primary client is the individual, which I get a real charge out of because it gives them the opportunity to put away the veneer, put away any protections and just be real and honest with somebody who's not going to write their evaluation, has no say over their promotion, um, and is just another human who's got some experiences they can bring to bear in terms of perspective and points of view. That's the bread and butter for me. And I love those conversations. Mm -hmm. Of course, like many of us, uh, I'm not going to disregard the other experiences I've got. And so I do workshops, uh, presentations. I've got one coming up on burnout here in the next uh, month. Um, but really the individual service is huge because I like to say, I help leaders lead leaders. And I love the cascading effect of a good leader who can affect a whole culture by virtue of being reasonably competent at their job. And sadly, some folks that we see, not in our clients, of course, other people, those people, <laughs> they mix up being a boss and being in charge and being a manager with leadership. And therefore, it gets convoluted and the experience the employees have is less because of that. And I love that you, you, you kind of, you, you said the quiet part right out loud, just reasonably competent. 
just reasonably yep. you're not asking for a whole lot to be able to do a whole lot and that's that's and I, I love the way that you just it's it's almost when you when you allow yourself to hear it you're almost slightly offended but in a, in a positive way where you're like you know what that's right the bar is not that high for me to be doing so much more good as a leader and i love the way that you you approach it because leadership always has that sort of magnifying cascading radiating effect a good leader is always mm -hmm. leading those around them and inspiring better leadership in those around them as they lead other people in their own spheres in their own circles right and i'm glad you picked up on on that piece of the description because you know folks might have a quick bristle reasonably competent no i am yeah. awesome yes you may be but we throw around descriptors like superstar rock star all these kinds of things that who really is honestly mm -hmm. And the people who are that in their job, maybe they're not that at home. We want whole people to be able to show up and be their whole selves at work and their whole selves away from work. Uh, so if it's a incremental change, that's a win. Let's take that and run. Uh, we don't need to go from 49% uh, good to 99% good. Let's hmm. go 49 to 50. Let's go 50 to 51. Let's make those changes so it can become habit and part of how you do what you do. And it's, it's re it really is about building those habits. A lot of people, they will get caught up. And this is, this is I mean, I've, I've tripped over this so many times in my life. I've lost count where I, I begin to get that feeling of forward momentum and that sense of what's possible. And then I want to do it all at once. I want to go, I want to go from 45 <laughs> right. to 99 or up to, you know, up to whatever, up to 11, if we're, if we're talking right, spinal tap. Right. And, <laughs> and it's, it's great to have that feeling. That feeling is fine, but then, what'll happen is you won't get there as soon as you think or as soon as you decide that you should or you'll or you'll meet an obstacle or you'll have a stumble and you'll lose that momentum and what what really mm -hmm. helps for me is realizing that that momentum occurs not just on the big swings but it occurs every single day every tiny step forward every habit established is momentum and it needs to be acknowledged right. as such so that you can keep that going and i think that's yeah i mean i know it sounds like just regular old folk wisdom but yeah you got to do a little bit every day <laughs> That's right. And sometimes the folk wisdom is there because of a reason. It kind of works and it makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, I love, and I'm, I'm just finding all these different places to attach in the way you're talking about. I love like the thinking about how people like they think about rock stars, the superstars or mm -hmm. whatever. And then you know what? They're few and far between. That's kind of what makes them right. rock stars. If everybody were a rock star, there yep. wouldn't be rock stars. But also <laughs> it's like, that's, that's a role. That is a particular right. role. And around the rock stars are all the people who play the instruments and set up the stage and drive the tour bus and produce the record and distribute the record. Like, there's all of this, like if you're just thinking about the analogy of a rock star, there are so many other roles that require strong leadership and mm -hmm. strong presence and showing up and doing the little things and the big things that allow that rock star to be the rock star, that allow the rock star to be whoever they are. And I just, I like just thinking about how we get these, these notions that there's a certain way that success will look and the, a certain way that mm. it will feel. And what we, I think we lose sight of, I know I lose sight of it is that there is tremendous joy and success and quite frankly, stardom in the little things. It keeps coming back to that for mm -hmm. me and in, in the little bits of work, the steps forward, the person you help, the person you lift up, the person you reach out to who lifts you up you know, the receiving right. as well as the giving. It's just, there's, there's stardom at every, at every stage. Absolutely. And to take that into a, um, not comparison, maybe, maybe even draw that thread out a little farther. How that person feels when they see that rock star on the stage doing their thing, they're in the zone and they are loving it. I would argue is not fully different than that little tiny bit of rock starness. That person feels the same way, whether it was a, a nice gesture at work, whether it was a, an uplift on a, project well done those small bits still makes them feel great it might not be sustained over a three-hour concert but it's still an awesome interaction they're like that's the kind of person i want to interact with because they make me feel good and that's kind of really i mean it's not what it's all about but just that if you if you what's what's the what's the phrase like, like leadership will it'll, it'll leave a mark there'll be a feeling and it's it's it can be until you learn how to identify it, I think it could be hard to pick mm -hmm. up on for some people. But once you, it's almost like like developing your palate for like a certain kind of flavor or whatever, where it's like, like the first time I had, you know, a glass of wine or whatever, I was just like, oh, that's wine. <laughs> it, it, right. it, it was just, it was all <laughs> wine. And it was like, that's right. interesting. And then after a while, like, you know, I made some friends and I tried some like Italian wines and French wines. And it wasn't because 
wine changed. It's because my ability to pick up on and discern different elements of it changed and also my ability to enjoy it and find joy in it. And I feel like it's it's the same way with so much of life where it's it's not so much that it's not already there for you to pick up on. It's just you have to develop mm -hmm. your taste. You have to develop your skills. And I do. That's right. another thing, too, that I encounter so much talking to coaches is that obviously there's a lot of this, a lot of these attributes that we that we desire in our lives to be a better leader, to be caring, to be compassionate, to be guides, to be open. And it's, it's, it's like one of those things where I think and again, I might I might be projecting yet again. We will we'll trip and fall into this like, oh, you just have to have you just have to have it. It's like grit or determination or some some ephemeral sort of, you know, ca um, category or characteristic mm -hmm. is a better word. Right. Whereas it's sure there's attributes of your, of your character, of your personage that contribute. But there are skills to learn. There are techniques you can learn to be a better leader like you can learn steps it's not just about like finding that well of strength within you and channeling it it's that too to a certain extent but mm -hmm. and this is where i love like, coaches like you where it's like you know what we're gonna identify what you what you want where you want to grow who you want to be and we're going to talk about exactly how you can do it and you get specifics right. and, that, and that's Obviously, I get a little passionate about it. That's what I love so much about coaching is it's 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 the big picture and it's the little picture, the thirty thousand feet and like the day to day ground level, and it's also just the uncovering and revealing what you are already and helping you to identify that and giving you the tools and the techniques and the skills to to go with it. Right, absolutely. And one of the things you mentioned there, where you're talking about the inherent skills, traits, and so forth. Sure, there's probably some of that and. Folks who look like they're exceptional and effortless will probably have some natural ability. But if we were to flip over to a sports metaphor, which is super easy and super overdone, but I'm going there. <laughs> Younger athletes who really shine because they're really good for their age and maybe even for a few age brackets up, they're fabulous. And that fabulous carries them on. And then when other people grow into their skills and talents, and pretty soon that fabulous, say, eighth grader is a so-so junior in high school because maybe they didn't develop the talents along the way. So folks who show up great as leaders, as coaches, and whatever skill, maybe it's natural. But then if they want to keep excelling and succeeding, developing those skills and talents further is going to help mm -hmm. them along the way. Otherwise, there's stagnation. It just stops with, I'm good, therefore I'm done. And when people think mm -hmm. that... Then they are done. They're pretty much toasted at that point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, I love that. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sports metaphors are always welcome <laughs> on this podcast. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I probably make them excessively, but I love them. And it, like you said, it tends to be a really easy way to communicate some pretty high level concepts in a way that people understand because a lot of people have familiarity with sports. Right. Yep. And I, I stop. Well, stop. I'll, I'll put a hard pause on the sports coaching compared to leadership coaching because we're not out there barking orders and directing plays. We're saying, what are the possibilities? Mm -hmm. What are some things you haven't explored yet? Tell me more about this space. Tell me what that looks like to you. Uh, whereas a coach, maybe with the exception of Steve Kerr, <laughs> are a little <laughs> more directive and a little more uh, engaged in like getting on the field and playing versus the coach is going to stand back and say, you tell me, I see what's happening. What are you experiencing? Well, now I know I could do this all day because, yeah, we're, we are. <laughs> uh, if we're, we're going to start bringing in, in, in NBA like basketball metaphors, they, we can, we'll go for hours. Um, right, right. And, and obviously, like, I, I kept finding things to attach to in what you were saying. So in, in the interest of time being a limited resource. <laughs> of course, yes. We may have to just do a part two, quite frankly. I'm just I'm, I'm enjoying talking to you. But before we go. <laughs> Where can people find out more about you? Where can people connect with you? Not just learn more about you, but like reach out to you, make a connection and see if you're a, a good coach for them. And then, you know, go from there. Right. Um, I'm going to start with the, the last piece first. Hmm. Um, if folks want to reach out and contact me, let's do so with the, the assumption that we just want to meet each other. Hmm. Um, if we're going to evaluate my coachiness, uh, we're going to skip past the, hey, how you doing and get straight to, what do you do? Who do you do it for? What's it look like? How much does it cost? That's important information after we decide, are we humans that are compatible? Mm -hmm. And to get to that point, um, my email is sam at 360-clarity.com. My website, same domain, 360-clarity.com. Uh, and of course, I'm all over LinkedIn uh, under the 
his username as I push back against the beginning is Dr. Sam Jennings. <laughs> so you can find <laughs> me on LinkedIn and see all about me out there as well. Excellent. Yeah, I find LinkedIn to be such a great, a great place, a great getting to know you place, especially for right. social media. It's got a lot, a lot of the the ability to make make new connections, but with a little more depth than a lot of other social media platforms, and with a little right. bit less tomfoolery might be the right. might be the kindest way to put it. So, yeah, I love <laughs> I love connecting there. And yeah, there there's quite a few Sam Jennings, but there there's only the one sure. Doctor Sam Jennings, the second. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Everybody else is an imposter. <laughs> well, Sam, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It was obviously, in my opinion, fantastic to talk with you. And I think we'll get to do this again soon. Oh, sounds great. It's my pleasure. And thanks for having me on. Of course. And to the audience out there, I ho hope you enjoyed that. You enjoyed this. I'm not even going to hope. I know you enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> fine, fine, Sam. Learn more about him. See if you guys are a good fit as humans, and then maybe you'll be a good fit as a as coach coachy. Um, and until then, we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>